Hello everyone and welcome to my talk, nine magic rules to make your debugging wizard. Then disclaimer, as I haven't invented those rules myself, so there is this guy called Dave Agans. He wrote a book about those debugging rules and he summed them up all in this book. And basically what I'm going to give you today is a spoiler of the book. And if you want to go deep with the details, then unfortunately you have to buy the book yourself. So I'm sorry for that. But then the next question is why am I giving this talk? This is very simple because I read this book, I think two times now, maybe three times. I was preaching this stuff to my colleagues all the time. And at one point they said, Martin, please don't preach this to us. Preach to someone else this book. And that's why I'm here. So let's get into it. Rule number one, understand the system. So this rule is basically about, as it always says, understanding the system. So usually, for example, it's about you read the manual or in my case, as a DevOps engineer, sometimes this tool is about ask stupid questions because you cannot debug something if you don't understand the system because the first thing you need to know is what is actually the real behavior or the correct behavior so you know the difference between what should happen and what is happening because if you don't know what's right or wrong, then how do you know there is a bug or not? Then next rule, number two, make it fail. And again, you cannot debug something if you don't know if it's there. Or for example, this is the, the standard case when you have a Jira ticket where somebody writes a bug report that says, hey, it doesn't work. That doesn't really help you. What you need is the perfect thing you have is you have some steps that say, do this, do this, do this, and then it fails. Sometimes you don't have that. So the next best thing you can do is make it fail more often because that way, you get the chance to see the bug more often, so you have more chances to figure out what is actually the problem and how you can solve it. <coughs> then, rule number three, quit thinking and look. With this rule, um, again, this is about, um, how to say, again, it's not just theories, what we need is data, because in this case, we are scientists. We are not doing theories, we need data to figure out what is actually the problem? Because for example, for this, I have a, I have a, a story for you because in our company, we have uh, several development environments and there is a support channel where people can write if there's a problem. So for example, then we get messages that, hey, the environment is broken. And then someone jumps in and says, ah, yeah, I think it, this is the problem because it's not working. Another one jumps in and says, no, it's this one. But actually what they all have is just series. But nobody actually took the time to, for example, look at the log outputs and figure out what is actually the problem. Because again, with theories, you cannot debug stuff. You need measurements or in our case, log files. Or for example, if you debug some electronics, this is now the time to not theorize about the problem, but for example, get the voltmeter out, measure some voltages, or get the oscilloscope out, figure out what's really going on in the system. Rule number four, divide and conquer. So this is, uh, for this one, I have a story for you as well. So there was this one customer and consultants, and they had a problem with connections to our system, and they already had two or three conference calls and didn't figure out the problem. So for some reason, I heard about this, and then somebody said, hey, let's put Martin into the call. So I went to this conf call and uh, asked stupid questions. Because again, we also know about debugging rule number one, understanding the system. So what I did in this call is, I asked my stupid questions. So on our side, and you, we had a firewall and a server. So I asked, hey, what do you have on your side? And surprise, surprise, they also have a firewall and a server. But again, about the where is the good side, where is the bad side. So what they did in the last conf course were, they figured out, yes, there's data flowing from their firewall to our firewall, from our firewall to our server, our server sends us back to our firewall, the data goes back to their firewall. And this is where basically everything stopped for the last three meetings and nobody figured out what's the problem. And again, so I knew from this that the good, that the good side was from, from their firewall to our system, everything was fine. So the problem must be somewhere else. So on this conf call, I asked one stupid question that was, hey, can we get some TCP dump, so Wireshark output, from the connection, from the interface of the customer's firewall to their server? So we got this, and then what we saw is, okay, there's data coming from the server to the firewall, 
we knew the data makes it all the way to our system and back, but there was no data from the firewall to the server. And nobody looked at that before on this conference. So everybody was surprised. Then someone at the call said, hey, wait a minute, let me try something. Clickety, 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 click, clack, and the problem was solved. In this case, somebody forgot to add a network address translation rule. Once the NAT rule was in place, the problem was solved. And I felt like the hero because I asked a stupid question that led to the solution. Then rule number five, change one thing at a time. This is a rule that I have to admit, I break it very often because, you know, it's just rules. Sometimes you don't follow them. But in this case, for example, usually when, we debug, when I debug a problem, you try to set some debug output. Okay, it doesn't work. You add some more debug output. Some try to change some things. It still doesn't work. You add some more code. Suddenly it works. And now the question is, which of your changes actually fixed the problem and which of your changes might have introduced other problems instead? So the, the idea is, if you, if you do this, that you do a change. If it doesn't work, you revert your change and try again from fresh. Because otherwise, you don't know which of your changes actually helped you solve the problem and which of your changes were completely irrelevant. Because the goal should be to do the minimal fix that just fixes the problem and not introduces new code, new changes that might introduce other problems. Because that way you get more bugs. I mean, this is fine. If you paid by the amount of bugs, then go ahead. Do it like this. Then, rule number six, keep an audit trail. In this case, again, this is a rule that is, for me and myself also, very difficult to follow. Because what this rule says is, write down everything. And I mean everything, everything you do, everything you observe. Because if you don't do that, then at one point you might again, you're in a debug session or for example, what we have more, more of sometimes is war rooms where we don't know where the production system is a problem and we need to figure out what's happening. And in this case, an audit trail is really helpful because at one point you solve the, the, the outage, but then again, what happened? What did we do? What actually solved the problem? And what did we do that was completely irrelevant that might be a good idea to undo again because it might cause problems later? And this is what the audit trail is about. And the other important thing uh, about the audit trail is, again, uh, it's better to have more information in your audit trail than not enough. Because if you have too much information, it's fine. If you not have the information you need to figure out what was the bug, you might still have the bug. So. Yeah, uh, rule number seven, check the plug. For this rule, I also have a story for you. Uh, a few years ago, I bought my girlfriend a new laptop. She was happy, she was fine. Then a week or two later, she was calling me at work and says, hey, Martin, the new laptop is broken. It doesn't work again. And I was, sure, it cannot be broken. I mean, it's new, it should be fine. But she said, no, 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 it's broken. I put a connected the charger to the laptop. I put the power cable to the power outlet. It should be fine. And then we figured out, okay, yes, those two things were right. But what you forgot, unfortunately, was put the charging cable, the power cable to the charger. Once we figured that out, the laptop worked again, all was cool, all was fine. So yeah, sometimes the bugs are not as complex as you think and they're just really simple to fix. So keep that in mind. Rule number six, get a fresh view. Sometimes the bugs you're looking for uh, you are run into some, some dead end and you have no clue where the bug is and you think, okay, now is the time to call in the reinforcements. And in this case, the very, very important thing is only if you call in the reinforcements, tell them only the facts of the problem. Don't tell them your theory, what the problem is, because you hunted this bug for hours, maybe days, so you prove to yourself that your own theory doesn't work. So please don't poison other people with your theory. Just tell them the facts and let them come up with a new theory that is hopefully better than yours and is causing you to find the problem. Rule number nine, if you didn't fix it, it ain't fixed. In this case, um, for example, you might think you solved the bug, but you haven't solved it and that's bad. Uh, and to make this... Um, <laughs> Yeah, for example, no. Nah. How did I want to explain this? Can't remember. Oh yeah, again, 
you have to prove somehow that your fix really fixes the problem. And one, po one idea is from the, from the make it fail part, from rule number four, you still know what are the conditions that cause the bug to appear. So in order to prove that your bug fix works, you just make sure you make the application, system, whatever, go into the bad conditions again. And if the bug doesn't happen anymore, you know, great, you fix the problem. But sometimes you have those hard to keep track of bugs where you need to do a lot of, inf where you need to have a lot of uh, test cases in order to see if it breaks or not. In this case, what you can do is make those lots of test cases, then okay, it doesn't break. Then the next thing you can do is remove your bug fix again, run the lots of test cases again and see if it breaks again. Because then you know, or can be very confident that your change actually fixes the problem and it doesn't, and it's really gone, basically. So yeah, those are the nine rules. Congratulations, if you follow them, you might be a debugging wizard now as well. And yeah, the, on the website of the debuggingrules.com, you get this poster with a with a reminder, so you can remember those uh, debugging rules. And yeah, if you have later questions and anecdotes for me, then go talk to me anytime. And it seems like I have lots of time left, so if you have some questions now, I guess I can take one or two. Yes? So, to me, at least the most problematic uh, bugs are those that are not very reproducible. Mm -hmm. Do you have some magic bullet? So the question was, do I have a magic bullet for bugs that are hard to reproduce? No, not really. The only idea I have is with rule number four is like make it fail more often. So the idea is if you have a bug that is hard to reproduce, then try to cause the system to have the bug appear more often because that way you get more data that hopefully helps you to figure out where the bug really is. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, perfect. Magic bullet, <laughs> yeah, again. Okay, yeah, I forgot to mention the rules are not magic. It's like they are just rules that help you. It's like... Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, other questions? Yes, please. Uh, this is a similar question. So, how do you approach like non deterministic or explosive tests? So, you, something fails sometimes and sometimes not. So, you really have no idea whether you fixed it actually or not. Yeah, that's tricky. But again, I can only offer the idea of make it happen more often. And again, hopefully, at one point, you got the. If you have enough data, you hopefully know what are the conditions that cause it. And again, with the audit trail, if you have more data, you hopefully at one point you start to see patterns. And once you see the patterns, you can go deeper with, let's say, a divide and conquer approach and see, okay, this is the point where everything is supposed, is still doing the way it's supposed to work. And this is where it gets interesting and the stuff is happening that is not supposed to happen. So, yeah, that's my, that would be my take on that one. More questions? I think we have still a minute or two. Yes, please. Uh, yes. Yes, so the question was about rule number eight with, uh, call with quit thinking and look. No, it was the call in the, re how did I call it? Let's see, how did I call it? Yeah, get a fresh view, exactly. Sometimes for the fresh view, you don't need other people. Sometimes you just need to walk away from the problem and let your mind run free, and then suddenly you have ideas. For me, this is usually, uh, so, so a little bit of oversharing. For me, this usually happens when I'm in a debug session for one or two hours, and then it's like, oh, I need to, I need to have a short toilet break. And then, ah, there is a new idea. And then suddenly this leads to, leads to the fixing, so yeah. Sometimes, again, yeah, sometimes you just need to step away from the problem and this is the way to get a fresh view. Yes, please. Uh, unfortunately, no, but that's a good idea to keep at least the screen thing. But again, what the, what the screen recording probably, yeah, yeah, that's at, le at least an additional tool to have the audit data. Yes, of course. So I guess no more time. So thanks everyone.